Hello, hello, hello. This is Eric. Before we get started on this episode, I just wanted to give you some contact information for this podcast. As always, we are on iTunes. Please, if you want to support this show, go to iTunes, subscribe, download, rate, and review us. That would actually help us out a lot. It is the easiest way for us to be exposed to new listeners. If you want to get in touch with us um, by email, you can reach us at bloodbath2podcast at gmail.com. With all of our contact information, when you hear two, it is the numeral two. It is not two spelled out. You can reach us on Facebook. All you have to do is search for Bloodbath 2 Podcast. We're on Tumblr at bloodbath2podcast.tumblr.com. And we're on Twitter at bloodbath2pod. We also have a YouTube channel, and it's the same thing. Basically, if you go to any social media site and you just type in and search Bloodbath 2 Podcast, you will get us. We would really like to have some contact from you, the audience, and uh, to start some conversations about the things we discuss. Uh, if it is of a negative nature, you can contact us if you want to argue or debate or correct anything we have. That is fine. We are open to criticism. Um, the one thing we do ask is that we will not respond to you if you are just simply going to troll us. But we will respond if you can um, phrase your criticisms either humorously or intelligently. So, like I said, we are not afraid of negative criticism at all. You know, bring it on. We want to discuss uh, with you these various things that we talk about on this podcast. And if you're a fan, yeah, get in touch with us uh, if you have requests, because uh, me and my co-host generally will talk about just about any subject. So please, get in touch with us. All right, so now we're going to get into it with the first edition, the first episode of DC Multiverse Crisis. Part one, zero issue. It's a real crisis, Mr. Frond. Yeah. It's a crisis! Yeah! We're having a crisis! All right! Hello out there, and welcome to our very first installment of DC Multiverse Crisis. In this series, we will be discussing the long-running DC Comics multiverse stories. In this series, it is the DC Universe itself, or multiverse, that will be the central character as is DC Comics, the uh, publishing entity. We will focus primarily on these stories, not on any particular character or writer or artist, uh, except as they're influential on the great multiversal structure of DC Comics. Now, don't worry. If you are new to this, we are going to give primers and explanations for just about everything. I really want this series to be a good starting point for a fan who is new to the DC multiverse. So, at the beginning of this episode, you heard the contact information for us. Please, contact me with questions, contact us with questions, and we will do our best to answer them in relation to this series. Now, as you can tell for this first episode, I am going to be flying solo. My co-host, Krista, will actually return with the next installment of this when we actually sit and talk about some of the first comics. So let's talk a bit about the structure of this podcast. For this episode, we're going to give you a basic framework to understand the DC multiverse going forward. We will look at the publishing history of DC Comics, as well as take a look at some of the individuals responsible for the creation of the DC multiverse. We're going to look at relevant types of stories from folklore and religion and science fiction that these stories were built on and inspired from. Now, I'm not going to explain everything right off the bat. That would ruin some of the surprises down the road. But we are going to give you enough to enable you to have some appreciation and understanding of these stories in a larger cultural, historic, and mythic context. This episode is going to be more academic and dry than the rest of this series will be. And the two comics that we're going to discuss um, on a later episode, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's um, two Golden Age comics, Wonder Woman 59 and Wonder Woman 89. I'll talk a little bit more about those towards the end. Going forward after that episode, the next installment of that will be two very important Silver Age comics, Showcase number 4 and Flash 123. After that episode, we are going to look at the Green Lantern, Earth 1, Earth 2 team-ups with Hal Jordan and Alan Scott. 
And after that, we will get into our first actual crisis title, Justice League of America 21 and 22 from 1963. This is the first of what would become an annual crossover between the Justice League, the JLA of Earth-1, and the Justice Society, the JSA of Earth-2. And we will look at each one of those crossovers um, eventually. Those crossovers would eventually culminate in the 1985-1986 Crisis on Infinite Earths maxi-series. It is a watershed story in comics and within the publication history of DC. And within the mythic narrative structure of the DCU, or DC Multiverse. After The Crisis... We will go on and look at every storyline we can find that has an element of the multiverse. These will include, but aren't limited to, Grant Morrison's Animal Man, Zero Hour, Infinite Crisis, Final Crisis, Flashpoint, Multiversity, and Convergence. Now here's where I have to point the listener to another podcast before we go on, and it's a major influence on this podcast, not only the series, but on Bloodbath 2 itself. For years, the, the great podcast, Comic Geek Speak, has been doing an outstanding series about Strictly Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's called The Crisis Tapes. It's, uh, like I said, it's, this is a major influence on this series. But we will be taking a slightly different tact than what they do. Crisis Tapes has been going on for years. <laughs> I, th- I think they're only now on the second or third issue of the of the actual series um after spending hours and hours um and podcast after podcast about what has led up to that series now i'm actually saying i'm not saying that's a bad thing it's actually a great thing for those of you who are interested in this that is absolutely a podcast series you should be listening next to this one for a purely scholarly overview of crisis on infinite earths i can't recommend that series enough the man who heads that series within the CGS family is Adam Murdo, and he is absolutely one of the best, if not the best, historian and analyst working in comic podcasts, um, in my opinion. I don't know the guy, but that's that's my opinion of him. He did his master's degree on Crisis on Infinite Earths, so that should tell you that the guy knows what he's talking about. We will be looking at the DC multiverse from the very, very, very beginning which is something that they could only skim through. And we will have a particular focus towards the mythological aspect of these stories as they reflect certain cultural ideas, scientific advances, and how it shows resonance from mythologies of the past. We will also stop to to laugh and poke fun at the utterly, utterly absurd and fantastic stuff we will encounter along the way. Let's talk about this multiverse and what makes it so special as this podcast goes on we will show you how this fictional multiverse has evolved over time but i just wanted to take a moment and draw attention to some aspects of it that for me as a reader makes it kind of my mythology of choice the dc universe for me are like my household gods and the dc multiverse is the space i like my imagination to dwell when given the chance A multiverse isn't really a new idea by science fiction standards, and we will look at that, the history of that idea in literature. And even DC's main competition, Marvel, has has a multiverse. It should be noted, though, that DC absolutely did this first, and it has become the defining idea of the company, in my opinion. It's why I don't like when they try to condense it or do away with the multiverse. The multiverse is pretty much the real, I don't want to say house style, but house idea of what makes DC so special. On a brief side note, if you take the start of the Marvel Universe, being the Silver Age with the publication of Fantastic Four, number one in 1961, which was an answer to the success DC was having with the Justice League, that makes the DC multiverse... 25 years older than the Marvel Universe, or Marvel, you know, well, yeah, at that point it was just a universe, it wasn't a multiverse with Marvel. With that, it's interesting that now, about 30 years after Crisis on Infinite Earths, Marvel is doing its latest Secret Wars, which bears more than just a passing resemblance to Crisis, as far as what it's doing for its multiversal structure. It's a collapsing of that. 
its plot is very different, and what it stands to do in the mythology is basically the same, however. It's to condense and to start anew. So, now for a little bit of trivia for you trivia buffs. Who knows, speaking rhetorically, who knows what the actual beginning of the DC Universe is? Now, most people say Action Comics number one with the first appearance of Superman, but this is absolutely wrong. The first time we have what would become a long-running DC Universe character was published in New Fun Comics number six, October 1935, with the first story featuring Dr. Occult. Dr. Occult was also created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Suster. So from the very beginning, you had those two guys. They had their DNA in the DCU. And this is before, obviously, their biggest contribution, which we will get to in a couple minutes. Now, if you listen to the first podcast, um, the first Bloodbath 2 podcast, you know my backstory. And my backstory is that I grew up in a comic store. Uh, my father owned a comic book store. And my mother was a writer and critic for the Comics Journal. So this stuff is in my blood. Now, I was 10 years old when Crisis on Infinite Earths came out. And it was a hugely, hugely influential book to me. It was the reading experience that opened up the DC multiverse for me. I had always preferred DC at that point anyway um, as a kid. And I was reading just about everything I could get my hands on um, as far as DC, but which you know wasn't hard. I could just re go over to the shelves, pick it up, and put it back. But most of it wasn't really kind of connected in my mind, mythologically speaking. But then Crisis came out, and suddenly these other titles um, that weren't necessarily superhero titles got dragged into this epic apocalyptic series, and you had characters interacting with this universal multiversal structure and and the justice league like characters like jonah hex and sergeant rock now when i was a kid this completely blew my mind now later on when i was a teenager i began to get interested in more esoteric aspects of life um away from you know science fiction comic books i developed a huge obsession with world myth uh, mythologies and religion um, as well as psychology and philosophy and occultism, basically I became interested in all the ways in which humanity has sought to kind of give meaning and understanding to life, to existence. And these interests were my central concern for a very long time. Most of my adult life, I thought I was going to be uh, an academic of some sorts involved in comparative religion. Now, now some of these interests are, are still with me to a pretty large extent. But when I would start getting back into comics, which was around 2000, my, my father's store closed in like 92 or 93. I graduated high school in 93 and I moved away and I worked in Hollywood for years. But I came back to my home state of New Jersey and I um, started working at a comic store. Again. And that was around 2000. Now, I came with all this baggage and bias of having studied real world mythologies, religions, and philosophies. So I began to see superhero books in that light with that agenda with that bias not so much it wasn't so much pulp entertainment to me anymore it wasn't strictly entertainment i was i started seeing something else in these stories they, they were living stories and current current archetypal manifestations of humanity's you know collective consciousness something that you know when it comes to archetypes it's something we don't really get to see in real time. We only look at it through the lens of history. We get to see these mythologies from the past, and we get to look at how those were archetypal manifestations of certain cultures. And looking through this lens of history, it's, well, it's a lousy history at that when you're talking about these ancient mythologies and religions. We really don't know enough about them to fully understand how these myths were born from those collective societies of the past. And any look back always has the arrogant, biased stance of the quote-unquote enlightened modern mind. But here, 
with the DC multiverse, we get to see a mythology happening in the here and now. Like I said, it's in real time. It's reflecting our culture. It's reflecting our fears and hopes back to us immediately. Now, the reason for this is, is due to comics regularly monthly release dates and need to be culturally relevant, comics stand apart as the best mirror of our culture that there is. Nothing comes close. Even TV has which tries to be topical, has a a time lag of a couple months to even a year or two years. Comics, it's weeks to a month. So creators need a constant flow of new information and understanding of current culture in order to make these stories relevant. So we have a nearly instant mirroring of our society. And since superheroes are perfect updates of mythological deities anyway, they are archetypal vesselence par excellence. If this wasn't enough charge to give life to the multiverse DC, DC has also done something that Marvel really hasn't. Through DC's publication history, it has gobbled up and assimilated other companies. Fawcett Comics, Quality Comics, Charlton Comics, Wildstorm. These at one time separate publishing universes have been assimilated on in whole and expanded the DC multiverse. Okay, every time DC has done this or incorporated elements from an imprint like Milestone and Vertigo, it it has add, added a whole new layer to the reality of the DC multiverse. In fact, if you really want to push the edge of that type of thinking, we can even begin to think of Marvel itself as a far removed but still connected uh, cousin mythology that inhabits the same omniversal uh, mythological structure as the DC multiverse. Now, I'm not saying that in any kind of legal or actually canonical way, and this might seem strange to those who think of you know canon as what an editor or a company tells you is canon and what isn't. But when you think in terms of archetypes and mythology. These things do not recognize copyright laws of the modern era any more than they obeyed the laws of nations and race in the past. Some archetypes pop up across world mythologies. There actually is, however, canon for the crossover of these two companies. Spider-Man and Superman crossed over in a 70s charity book. And that's something that was referenced just recently on a cover of the recent uh, Secret Wars miniseries from Marvel. A barely veiled analog of the Flash shows up in Marvel continuity after, um, spoiler alert, after Barry Allen dies in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, the implications that where Barry went after dying there was the 616 Marvel Universe. And uh, as this character known as Buried Alien, it's in um, Quasar number 17, I think, in 1990. Clark Kent, straight off the page, is in Thor 341. George Perez uh, draws Peter Parker into one of the panels in Crisis on Infinite Earths. We have the Amalgam Universe stories and JLA vs. Avengers. Also, the um, analogs of the Avengers recently seen in Multiversity and Marvel's uh, Squadron Supreme, which is an intentional riff and analog of the Justice League. So it's Almost that all of DC and Marvel and their respective multiverses are a part of a giant omniverse of mythic super beings. Uh, that's the way I like to look at it. But DC as the originator and usually more expansive and imaginative multiverse is the heart of it all. This isn't necessarily to bash Marvel. There are periods of times when Marvel is clearly the superior publisher putting out much better work than DC. And the truth about that, I mean, if you really want to sit there and argue about which company is better, if you know anything, if you really know anything about comic books and the history of comic books, you know that what happens is these companies essentially trade off on quality. You know, for a bunch of years, it's DC doing the best work. And then for a bunch of years, it's Marvel doing the work. I, you know, I haven't really wrapped my brain around why that seems to be the case. I mean, just as an example, for instance, 
Well, first of all, the Golden Age basically belongs to DC. Marvel doesn't really exist as the entity we know it until the Silver Age. Now, I would actually argue that as much as I like the DC Silver Age for various reasons, Marvel's Silver Age work is, on a pure craft basis, superior. It's just better. It's better story writing. It's obviously better art, thanks to Kirby and Ditko. And I think that quality with Marvel extends into the Bronze. Um, the Bronze Age for me in comic books, like with Marvel, that is my favorite era of Marvel. Once you get into the 80s, it is clearly, I think, DC's turn to to take over the reins of what is pushing the boundaries and, and creative envelopes for the comic superhero medium. Uh, during the 90s, I think we had a bit of a falling out with both companies, but there's still good quality being published. Um, when I got back into comics, like I was saying, around 2000 and 2001, one of the things I noticed, because I already had this idea of the uh, the muse going from one company to another, but around that time, it really seemed like it was one of the only eras I can think of where there was high quality in both companies at the same time. Now, I would also argue that recently, post-New 52, that Marvel has actually been the superior creative force. That is, certain editorial focuses have enabled creative content that's more appealing and more interesting than, say, what DC was doing. Now, again, that's just my opinion. If you, want, if you want to discuss that, drop me a line. We will absolutely discuss that. But this podcast isn't necessarily about craft. It's about mythology. We will absolutely discuss writing and art and craft, but it's not my primary focus. Uh, licensing rights and other means have also allowed DC to expand its multiverse through its connection to He-Man, for instance. They had a deal through uh, Mattel, and as of this podcast recording, DC has been publishing a He-Man comic, uh, The Eternity, uh, Eternia War, by uh, Dan Abnett. And that's actually rather good, although its connection to the DCU isn't really defined. I, I, I don't think it's been mentioned at all. Also, the world of Oz and Wonderland are connected, which are, I mean, those are public domain. But what they were featured in a comic put out by DC called The Oz Wonderland War, which featured a crossover between these two universes and DC's beloved Earth-26 team of Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew. Now, I highly recommend getting The uh, Oz Wonderland War if, if you can find it. Maybe you have recently been exposed to Captain Carrot, either through Convergence or through his outstanding appearance in um, Multiversity. You need to pick up this book. It's fantastic. There are also have been two times in which DC has allowed a creator to just add a whole new layer to DC on their own. First, Jack Kirby. We have his edition of The Fourth World and Neil Gaiman's Endless via The Sandman. Now, Sandman often gets lumped in with Vertigo, but Sandman was originally released before Vertigo was a thing. It was it was one of the titles that inspired them to actually collect it all under that imprint. But Sandman originally takes place in the DC universe. And those of you who have read it obviously know major DC characters and not so major DC characters make appearances from John Constantine to Superman. So where does it all start? Well, it all really starts with a gentleman named Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. Nicholson himself is a real-life adventurer and war hero, uh, the kind of person that seems more likely to be in a comic book or a pulp mag than being essentially the creator of comic books as we know it. Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson was uh, born in 1890 to a fairly affluent upper-class military family. Malcolm's grandfather was a Massachusetts-born cavalry officer and surgeon who fought in the Civil War. Malcolm spent much of his youth um, at a horse ranch in Washington State. His mother was a journalist who often entertained various influential people, uh, politicians, writers, journalists, at the house. You know, Nicholson interacted with these people, these thinkers. Uh, Kipling uh, and Teddy Roosevelt were both guests of the Nicholson family at one point. Malcolm would go on to have a fairly distinguished military career after graduating from the Manilius, uh, M Manilius uh, School uh, Military Academy. He became possi possibly 
one of the youngest officers in the cavalry, although sources are kind of conflicted about that. He fought the Bolsheviks in Siberia and was part of the unit that hunted uh, Pancho Villa. He served under, um, uh, geez, uh, this name, under um, Pershigan and fought the Muslim Moors in the Philippines, where in the Philippines he also admitted he uh, played uh, a lot of polo. After World War I, Nicholson began to very publicly criticize Army Command. This, according to the Wheeler Nicholson family, led to a U.S. Army sanctioned assassination attempt that left Malcolm in the hospital from a bullet wound. Um, I don't believe that's been substantiated, but that is the theory of the family. He would resign from the Army in 1923 and began a career in publishing. Uh, he wrote a lot. He wrote uh, a Western novel, Death at the Corral, and he ghost wrote some uh, adventure novels for Street and Smith Publications and wrote historical adventure fiction for both Adventure and Argosy uh, magazines. But here's what is important um, and, and what you need to know. After Malcolm saw how successful something called Famous Funnies was. Now, Famous Funnies was the proto-comic book. It, it took previously published, you know, comics from the newspapers and published them together as an anthology. Okay, so he started a publishing company called National Allied Publications to capitalize on this trend. What he found out was that all the rights for republishing, uh, republishing these comic strips were all tied up. He couldn't get his hands on any of them. So, cover date, February. 1935, new fun number one came out. This is the first real comic book, okay, as it contained original material. It wasn't reprints. Now, this was on the stands. Um, this is a personal connection to me. It was on stands January 11th, 1935. Now, that date is relevant because... January 11th is also my birthday. So, you know, if growing up in a comic store wasn't a connection enough, it seems that me and comic books actually have the same birthday. Three years after introducing Dr. Occult, 1935. In 1938, Jerry and Joe, after numerous rejections from publications across the country, would have their creation, Superman, published in National Allied Publications first issue of Action Comics number 1. Side note, Action Comics number 1 would also be the first appearance of Zatara, who would later go on to be retconned as the father of Zatanna. And those Zatara stories are a lot of fun if you get a chance to read them. I I feel we don't pay enough attention to some of those kinds of things, but it, it, for instance in in that first issue, he turns a crook like uh a bank robber or something, into a daffodil. It's amazing. Magic characters in the Golden Age um, allowed writers to be incredibly whimsical and imaginative. Now, we like to kind of bet, once you get into the Silver Age, we like to kind of bash magic as a plot device, but it's a plot device that just enables you to suspend that window of disbelief just enough in order to really express some wonderfully insane and zany ideas. And and I always read magic characters for that reason. It's not really about the mechanics. It's about, like, how far out can you get with a concept? And, and, and that's something that I feel we has really gotten lost uh, through the history of comics. And we get what, what we get now, which is this absurd idea that a good superhero story requires, that dreaded word to me, requires it to be grounded in our notion of reality. Now, we've actually talked about that on the regular podcast uh, numerous times, and we'll do it again. I'm not. I'm not going to get too far off that into that tangent here. Now, from there, Action Comics number one, all hell essentially breaks loose as far as superheroes go because Superman ends up being a monumental success. Now, through the publishing history of Superman for like the next 20 years, it's been noted by certain economists and writers that Superman had more merchandising and made more money than the Beatles did, per capita. Now, the mass mystery men begin to take over this new medium, okay? Comic books can be made to express any medium. And in the beginning, 
when you read those early pre-Action Comics national comic books like Adventure Comics and Fun and stuff like that, there's all different genres. There's westerns, there's crime, there's science fiction. But it's only for a couple years you have that window. So it's like, essentially, the superhero genre and the comic book are kind of twins. They're born at about the same time. And basically, the reason superheroes work so well in this medium is it is relatively cheap, dirt cheap, to portray these fantastic things visually. And you just can't do it in other mediums. And you couldn't do it until recently. Uh, That's why comic books have been the medium of choice for superheroes. Even though, right in the beginning, we have things like radio shows and early television shows that really take off, it's, it's the marriage of the superhero and the comic book that really is magical. And for me personally, that is sometimes kind of... I have conflicted feelings about that because there's a lot of great comic work that happens outside of this superhero genre that tends to get ignored and marginalized and forgotten simply because people mostly just want to see uh, superheroes punching each other in the head. Now, like I said, these superheroes take over this industry. And it wasn't just at National. Every company tried to recreate the success of Superman. And some would do it better, in my opinion. Um, such as Fawcett Comics's uh, Captain Marvel. If you've never read the Captain Marvel Golden Age stuff, you, I can't recommend it enough. But it's it's a certain acquired taste because words like zany and whimsical and imaginative, that's what that book really is. If you're a modern reader who likes grit and realism, you're probably going to hate those stories. But there's an inner child in me that's still in that comic store that loves these wonderfully absurd adventures that these costumed characters have. If you are in touch with that, yes, you need to pick up as much early Captain Marvel as you can. Now, within National, obviously one of the biggest successes that was trying to recreate the Superman formula was Batman, uh, published for the first time. Detective Comics, number 27, May 1939. Now, Detective Comics was one of the three comic titles that were published under Wheeler Nicholson's leadership, the other two being New Fun and New Adventure, uh, which uh, New Adventure would become Adventure Comics and would run for a very long time under that. Eventually, under financial pressure, Malcolm would end up selling his rights to these titles to our second (laughs) great real-life character of this story, Harry Donenfeld. Donenfeld was a was a pulp magazine publisher slash pornographer, okay? It wasn't just that he published pulps. He published racy pulps, ones that were basically people went to prison for. He allegedly had ties to organized crime. He was a complete showman. He was a complete con man, and he was a drinker and a boaster. So here's the thing about Donenfeld. If... Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson was essentially a real-life pulp hero, then Donenfeld was more the type you see in pulp and in comics as a classic villain. He is an arrogant gangster scoundrel swindler. Donenfeld and his business partner, Jack Leibowitz, who was the accountant, he, he was he was the business to Harry's showmanship. And, you know, Jack was the numbers man. And along with another gentleman named Max Gaines, they would form the true basis of what would become DC Comics after essentially edging Wheeler Nicholson out of the door. Um, Max Gaines' son, Bill Gaines, is a name you should remember. He would go on to start Mad Magazine and EC Comics, and Bill would almost single-handedly destroy comics by giving an embarrassingly arrogant testimonial before Congress during the whole seduction of the innocent issue. Now, back to Donenfeld for a second. Like, at one point, he was going to go to jail for pornography, and he actually talked one of his um, underlings. I, I can't remember that guy's name, but and I don't even know if it's a ma- if it is a matter of record, but he talked to somebody into taking a fall for him and spending time in jail under the promise that they would have a job for life at basically DC Comics. Now, over at Timely Comics, 
which is the precursor to Marvel. They had two fairly unique characters in this vast ocean of Superman clones and 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 attempts to recreate you know the success DC was having, and it was Namor the Submariner and the Human Torch. Now this isn't the Fantastic Four Human Torch. This was an android, and both these cower- characters were relatively unique. I mean, one of the things, another recommendation I have for you is the Golden Age Namor. One of the things that set sets him apart is when you read all of this Golden Age stuff, all these characters are universally champions of social justice, champions for the status quo, crime fighters. Namor is an eco-terrorist. Okay, he actually kills people and innocent people because of their ecological crimes. Pick it up. You should read that stuff because it it stands out. It is a stark contrast to uh, what is often kind of a saccharine take on superheroes in most other companies. And Marvel in the Silver Age posits itself as kind of a more humanistic and more realistic expression of superheroes, as opposed to what DC was doing. There is absolutely elements of truth to that, most notably in, obviously, the Fantastic Four and in Spider-Man. But we can even see that idea in embryo form here with what they're doing with Namor. Now, Timely, with these two characters, did something revolutionary. And this is giving Marvel credit. No one else had thought of this yet. They had these two characters cross over and fight each other. Now, that doesn't sound revolutionary, but up until that moment, there was no reason to think that any of these characters in any of these companies inhabited the same universe. Not to be outdone. National picked up on this success, and that was a success, and came up with the first superhero team. Because, hey, if having two characters came together would work, why not have eight? The Justice Society of America debuted in All-Star Comics number 3, 1940. And the original membership was Dr. Fate, Our Man, The Spectre, Sandman, The Atom, The Flash, Green Lantern, and Hawkman. This whole thing was basically conceived by Sheldon Mayer and Gardner Fox. And we will talk a lot about both those gentlemen in these early episodes. At that point, the DC Universe, but not the multiverse, but the DC Universe was now underway. Some more trivia for you. Do you know when Superman and Batman met for the first time? Now, it didn't happen in the comics, like most people would think, but was in an episode of the outstanding and groundbreaking radio show Adventures of Superman. The Adventures of Superman radio show also introduced Kryptonite, Lex Luthor, and Jimmy Olsen. Now, there was a character in the comics just known as Luthor. He was a red-headed mad scientist. It is the radio show that really introduced this character of Lex Luthor that built upon that character. Also, there is some debate as to whether either The Adventures of Superman or the Fleischer cartoon series uh, was the first place in which Superman flew, as opposed to Jump, right? So... That is still uh, debated to a certain extent. Now, both those things are relatively easy to get. You know, the Fleischer cartoons uh, you can get on DVD, and the Adventures of Superman are all on the Internet Archive, or as many of them as have survived. If you're really a fan of this character, and if you're a fan of DC Comics and adaptations, you should watch that series, and you should listen to that radio show. That radio show... I was skeptical about when it first showed, because I hadn't listened to, to, I don't think, any of it. Uh, but when it showed up in the Internet Archive, I started listening to it. And it is an incredibly compelling and very tense storytelling adaptation. Uh, it, it's it, it's no surprise when you start listening to it that it went on for as long as it did. It is that good. And there's lots of things about that show, like the introduction of all these story elements, plus the fact that at one point that show actually would uh, undermine, in real life, uh, the KKK. They would actually give away certain things about the KKK during the radio show and had a whole series that was a, a commentary 
uh, against them. I think it was called the Brotherhood of the Fiery Cross that Superman had to deal with. But anyway, go listen to him. I challenge you on that. It's really good. But going back, so for the next 15 years, comic books, and especially superhero comic books, would be the most pervasive and successful entertainment medium. Readership of the top book was in the millions. Essentially, every kid in America was reading comic books. Uh, Harlan Ellison, science fiction writer, said that there are only three great indigenous American art forms. Jazz, baseball, and the comic book. These books and the superheroes inside them thrived during the war years, where they were sent overseas to the GI as cheap but inspiring patriotic entertainment. Now, this truly was a golden age, until 1954 and the publication of Seduction of the Innocent by Frederick Wortham, which posited often through contrived and completely made-up, quote, evidence and testimonials, that the comic book was destroying the children of America. And our country, the USA, bought this hook, line, and sinker. There were mass burnings of comic books that were organized. The Comics Code Authority was established to regulate and censor any questionable content or what they thought was questionable content. Horror and crime comics went virtually extinct. Companies went out of business left and right, and sales of superhero comics dwindled severely. It should be noted that except for some short spurts, usually over just a couple issues or one title, we would never, ever again see the level of popularity and sales numbers like we saw in the Golden Age. This drop in favor, popularity, and sales is actually hugely important overall to the growth of the DC multiverse. Enter former pulp literary agent Julius Julie Schwartz. Like nearly all of the first two generations of comic book pioneers, Julie was from New York City. He was a Bronx kid. In 1932, he co-published Time Traveler, one of the first science fiction fanzines, along with his childhood friend, the notorious Mort Weisinger, more on him as we go, and the legendary Forrest J. Ackerman, who would end up publishing the much-beloved and groundbreaking fanzine Famous Monsters. Schwartz, as an agent, represented writers like Alfred Bester, Robert Block, Ray Bradbury, and H.P. Lovecraft. Schwartz also helped organize the first World Science Fiction Convention in 1939. All of that I note because it's important to remember that Julie was a fan, and he loved this stuff. Just like his buddy, Forrest J. Ackerman, they lived and breathed the fantastic and the pulps, and saw it as a way to both make a buck and capitalize on, as well as a legitimate form of entertainment, um, and maybe even art. And unlike Julie's Marvel equivalent of Stan Lee, Julie had no pretense about being a writer. Julie came up with lots of ideas, story ideas, character direction, but he was first and foremost an enabler of creators, of content, enabler of ideas. He was a leader, as long as it made money. Now, make no mistake, Julie was also out to make money. I don't want to paint him as too much of a patron of the arts, because when it comes to disposable cheap serial narratives, it's really about the bottom line. Now, with dwindling anemic sales, Julie saw they had to reinvigorate their old characters. Uh, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman had all essentially survived the comic book burning times, so to speak, but much of DC's characters were no longer in use. So in an attempt to revive the superheroes and sales of these books, Julie had his creators update various superheroes with like new sleek designs and more modern science and science fiction-based origins. And we will go over these as we get to them, but the first one who received this treatment was The Flash. The Golden Age Flash was a guy named Jay Garrick, who got his powers from, quote-unquote, hard water. To which Mark Wade, uh, writer Mark Wade, once said, well, hard water is just ice. And, you know, Jay Garrick's costume was a direct inspiration of Hermes Mercury. Which I always liked because of my understanding of mythology. But Neil Adams once said that it was one of the worst costume designs in comic history. I respectfully disagree with Adams on that one, but it's true. It 
wasn't really something modern enough to capture a reader's attention. The new Flash was Barry Allen, forensic scientist who got his powers from a horrible accident of science, which is like every sci-fi B-movie of that era. Again, we'll get into complete detail with these stories when we get to them, but here's where we have the Flashpoint event in which a universe becomes a multiverse. For the readers who might remember the old Jay Garrick Flash, how do you have a new Flash? You know, Schwartz and writer um, Bob Kaniger had, had a brilliant idea of how to overcome that. Barry Allen would become the Flash to honor his boyhood hero Jay Garrick, the Flash, who wasn't a real person to him, but he read Flash comics when he was growing up. With that, the universe of the Golden Age becomes the literary comic books of this new continuity. Later on in The Flash of Two Worlds, Flash 123, we learn what is really going on is that all of the Golden Age has occurred on an alternate Earth, Earth 2. So this now main continuity and those events have somehow been transmitted via comic books, via art, into what is now called Earth 1. It wasn't just that Jay Garrick and Alan Scott and the original Adam and Hawkman were just comic books. But those comic books were somehow a window into another universe that actually existed from Barry Allen's point of view. Grant Morrison's Multiversity will take this idea of comics as transmission technology from other dimensions to its inevitable medical, uh, meta conclusion. Uh, yet again, I'm going to stop along the way and say, you need to read this or you need to read that. You need to read that. Uh, multiversity is outstanding. From there, it's only logical if there is Earth 1 and 2. Is there an Earth 3 or 4? How many Earths are there? With each subsequent annual team-up of the JLA and JSA through the 60s and 70s, tons of Earths were added. But not only that, but there were various imaginary stories throughout DC that weren't coherent with the main continuity. So they would just say, oh, it's just one of these other Earths. This escalated into a multiverse growing out of control. If the Golden Age was the first great period of growth and the Wortham book and its effects became the first great constriction of the DC universe, this was the first great period of multiversal expansion. Already we see the mythology evolve to another level of complexity from what it was previously. It's not just that the Silver Age changed the DCU. It expanded it and made it more complex. It's, it's an evolution. Now, many fans and creators were completely confused by what was going on with all these Earths. For various reasons, it was decided within DC that a simplified canon would be better and would enable more readers to jump into a less chaotic continuity. So Crisis on Infinite Earths was published. It's an apocalypse, an Armageddon, a Ragnarok of the DC multiverse that attempted to do two things. Reboot everything back to day one and attempt to simplify continuity and do away with the multiverse. Okay, the first part was accomplished. But we can see that, you know, doing away with them with the multiverse and simplifying continuity were complete failures. Several characters had severe, severe continuity errors that have become legendary most famous being Hawkman. But Wonder Woman had some problems, too. We'll get to both of those at a later date. And as far as ending the multiverse, well, it was only about three years later that Grant Morrison quietly brought back the pre-crisis multiverse um, in his run on Animal Man. Now, the Hawkman thing, I'm not even going to attempt to explain at this point. That is probably going to need to be a whole podcast unto itself when it becomes relevant. Now, that's it as far as DC history and multiverse history. I'd like to go now and take a look at the history of alternate dimensions in stories before this. So here's a question for you. I want you to think about it. Do you know what literary work is considered basically the first known case of uh, alternate universe or reality? Now I'm not talking about what will be known like the magical fairy realm from folklore and religion. We're going to get to that in a minute. But what is the first kind of fiction work that can, like, be the embryo, the, the seed from which these kinds of stories, you know, grow from? I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Think about it. 
No? Okay, so Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, wrote something called The Blazing World in 1666. When I was doing my research for this, I was actually kind of shocked that it was that early because I kept thinking, well, you know, there's Oz and there's, you know, you know, there's Wonderland, you know, how and you just keep going back. And eventually I found this. And unless somebody can correct me on this, I think that is the earliest as far as literary descendant of alternate dimension, alternate earth kind of story. OK, in that story, a heroine passes through a portal at the North Pole. To a fantastic, crazy realm of talking animals and submarines. Yep, now this is before Jules Verne. Not that Verne really predicted submarines, but, you know, they had been used by then, but Verne often and gets credit for that. In an interesting synchronicity, we have, with comics, having elements of both magic, fantasy, and science. Back then, Cavendish released Blazing World with another book, her observations upon experimental philosophy, basically a philosophical scientific uh, text. In Alan Moore's League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, um, it's the first League uh, stories, uh, the one led by um, Prospero, right? There's a, a dimensional traveler who says he comes from the blazing world. Uh, China Myville has an Easter egg in his book um, On London, where there's like a book which is a... Um, guide to people who traveled blazing worlds i think it was and you know i mean my those books are often all about alternate reality settings the idea of a young woman adventuring into a hidden realm of magic would obviously become a fantasy trope in its own right with oz and wonderland much later now here i think it's important to make a certain distinction the distinction between an alternate universe story and a magical world story like the realm of the fairies. You know, ever since early man huddled around the campfire and told stories to pass the time, to pass on culture, and to convey meaning and connection, we have wondered about realms just beyond our senses, you know, kingdoms of monsters and spirits, you know, just beyond the glow of the campfire, hidden away in dark places, inhabited by forces that would abduct us, never to return to our families or our tribe again. You know, if, if Ukla wandered out at night and was never seen again, well, maybe some evil spirit abducted him. These are places in which beings of monumental powers moved cloud and blasted the earth with lightning, places from which our own planet and, you know, ourselves were formed. Humanity has always been imaginative, right? <laughs> now, combine that with some local flora that could absolutely induce states of mind in which those realms become as real as this one, and you have the beginning not only of fantastic storytelling, but essentially of religion. It's this shamanic experience of that. Religions have always posited a realm of gods or spirits to which man might be the product of, victim of, or completely inconsequential to. And once religion loses its relevance to humanity in a broader sociopolitical way, it becomes an artifact to curate in history. It's, you know, that's kind of the academic definition of a mythology. When you really look at it, you know, Shinto spirits, pagan stories of the Fae, Middle Eastern jinn, Asian celestial dragons, Native American trickster deities, Judeo-Christian angels, are all narrative ancestors of superheroes, um... And not only that, but of like, you know, Jedi and Sith Masters, of brooding emo vampires and shape-changing robot aliens. It, it, this kind of storytelling has been with us since the beginning of humanity itself. But magical realms that lie within or superimposed on our own reality, but just out of reach of us, they might be the earliest narrative idea of quote-unquote alternate Earth or universe. It is still a bit different. I mean, it's kind of the story you know, descendant of those things. The alternate Earth, however, is the evolution of that idea. It is a quantum leap of creative thinking. In the same way, you know, animism in religious history turned to polytheism, which in turn evolved into monotheism. So throughout human history, there's this rich history of alternate dimensions, beginning with those early proto-religious uh, shamanic stories to the blazing world, to Flatland by Edwin Abbott in um, 1884. There's H.G. Wells' Men and Gods in 1923. Um, 
Murray Leinster's Sidewise in Time in 1934, H. Um, Beam Piper's Paratime series in the 40s, What Mad Universe by Frederick Brown in 1949, Oz and Wonderland stories, obviously. Now, nearly all of these are more akin to the fairy magical realm of stories than a true alternate Earth type of story that we will encounter in the DC multiverse. Even though some clearly state that they are alternate dimensions, what we are looking for is a case in which two dimensions are not really removed from one another as far as the basic reality, the basic ground rules between them. In the DC multiverse, Earth 1 and Earth 2 are not drastically different, except for the cast of characters and when events take place. While most of these fantasy stories, these fairy stories, these alternate dimensions are drastically removed from our world and just how exotic and magical they can be. Even in something like What Mad Universe, the world appears to mirror our own, but in that you have things like sewing machines that are able to open portals to outer space. Now, it could be that this type of alternate Earth story is only possible within the superhero genre because with superheroes, the fantastic is established through the characters, not necessarily the world itself. And in every one of these early sci-fi and fantasy stories, it is the world that exists as an example of the fantastic. Even the first two alternate Earth type stories in the DCU, the two one woman stories we're going to look at, are more akin to the standard magical realm fairyland than what we will see in later in the DC alternate Earths. You know. So, if we say that specifically Flash of Two Worlds introduces this for the DCU, is there any other contemporary stories that introduce this idea first, the alternate Earth story first? Now, the Mirror Universe of Star Trek was originally introduced in the original series in the episode Mirror Mirror. Now, that qualifies for me as a mirror universe is basically exactly the same. The major difference is that there's a moral inversion of all the characters in that episode. But that came out in 1967, so that shouldn't get the credit. It's after this. So then I started thinking about the first season, or, or the first couple seasons of The Twilight Zone. And I was thinking about um, an episode called Mirror Image, and it's written by Rod Serling in which evil versions of people from alternate dimensions come through to our world and they can only survive by eliminating their counterparts. You know, truly horrific idea. This is aired on February 1960. However, in this story, the alternate dimension is spoken of in, in very vague ways and never shown. So does it qualify as being first? Not sure I'm on the fence with this one, but I'm, I'm leaning towards no, actually. It should also be noted that the same season of Twilight Zone had an episode called um, 16mm Shrine, also written by Serling, about um, it's an aging actress who is able to walk into her old movie. Uh, even though Showcase Number 4 came out in 1956 and establishes the potential for meta, uh, meta narrative, there is no interaction between. Earth 2 and Earth 1 until Flash 123 in 1961. So this Twilight Zone episode does beat DC to the metafiction punch, but only in that. Eventually, I, w I found an episode uh, 23 of Twilight Zone, A World of Difference, Richard by, uh, written by Richard Matheson, who, great, uh, fantastic pulp fiction writer who wrote I Am Legend, What Dreams May Come, Hell House, Stir of Echoes. This aired March 11th, 1960, tells the story of a character in a movie who one day finds out that his life has been a movie and was being filmed and that he was played by an actor. An alternate world is never explicitly said, and it qualifies absolutely as metafiction. The implication of the story is that the actor and the character who, who played him have switched universes. Or at least that's an interpretation. If you've seen it, you can let me know. Email me and let me know whether you think that qualifies. <laughs> now, at this point in my research of trying to find like this contemporary alternate Earth story genesis, I just I gave up and I decided to be a bad researcher. You know, I could pour through books and TV, but what about pulp magazines and radio dramas? I, I, 
I simply don't have the time to research this. Uh, I have a job, unfortunately, and it's a, it's a terrible job that has nothing to do with the things I'm interested in. If, if anyone out there actually knows the answer to this question, what was the first alternate Earth type story? And remember the, ca the caveats. This is not simply an alternate dimension story or like a magical fairy realm story. It, it's as I defined an alternate Earth like we have in the DC multiverse. We need the universes to essentially be grounded by the same rules of reality. Now, as I said, one reason that Flash might be the first is the idea that the superhero is the manifestation of the fantastic. Um, the world they inhabit isn't. Also it could be that the, the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics and the, had not really disseminated into the mainstream enough to inspire these kinds of stories yet. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh no, is he going to talk about quantum physics? Yes, he is, briefly. For no other reason other than it absolutely influences this kind of storytelling, and it's fascinating. To put it lightly, <laughs> this is an incredibly complex subject, and I am not a scientist. Over the years, I've probably read two or three dozen books on quantum mechanics, and I'm going to do my best to give you a very, 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 very basic overview of what it is in order to allow you, the reader, to have a better understanding of how scientific ideas influence fantastic stories, and sometimes vice versa. Quantum mechanics is a scientific theory that was created in order to try and explain some inexplicable behavior of subatomic particles that is inconsistent with the relativistic theory of Einstein. Now, through a double slit experiment in which photons of light were passed through two parallel slits with a photographic plate behind the slits, scientists discovered something kind of crazy, that you get this wave interference pattern that suggests a photon essentially goes through each slit simultaneously interferes with itself and lands on the plate directly behind it. Um, this is, you know, evidence that particles exist in a quantum state of flux um, until measured. Again, this is all very basic stuff that I'm trying to explain, uh, or it's very complex stuff I'm trying to explain very simply. Now, this has been replicated in various types of particles, including atoms. So the question is, if atoms can exist in multiple places at once, and since we are made of atoms, why can't we? Now, since I've read about this for years, and I'm not saying I understand it, I have thought about it, and, and something I, I think about is the idea about a threshold amount of matter or mass that anchors something to be more mathematically probable of existing somewhere, and that connections to other entities like other particles makes a, ne a neighboring particle more likely to not be in multiple places or in other places at the same time. That is pure speculation on my part. Everything to every scale might, might be in a state of quantum flux. Now that if these photons were unobserved, you'd get an interference wave pattern. What this led to was the idea that subatomic particles exist in absentia of observation as quantum field of, in a quantum field of probability meaning that any particle could theoretically exist at any point in the universe. It is only when it is observed or measured that this wave of probability breaks down or quote-unquote collapses into its mathematically probable state of being a finite particle at this set of coordinates in space-time. Now, this was further illustrated um, by the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Now, if you're interested in that, I highly recommend the John Gribben books, um, In Search of Schrodinger's Cat and Schrodinger's Kittens and The Search for Reality. Now, where you get into the idea of parallel universes is the idea that a particle can theoretically exist at any point in space-time and is, let's say, bounded to certain possible locations by probability. Now, if quantum mechanics wasn't complex, unintuitive, and abstract enough, we have Hugh Everett's formation of the many worlds theory. Now, to be honest, I couldn't even begin to explain the mathematics and theories involved in this and the jump from quantum mechanics to this, except to say that the, okay, the Copenhagen interpretation, 
which is the probability wave a particle exists in prior to observation and consequent collapse into a definite particle by measurement itself is a conceptual flaw, being that the subject-object relationship of that event is itself existing in a sort of quantum probability wave. Thus, the Copenhagen interpretation is essentially false. Okay, that's the basic groundwork of the many worlds theory of Hugh Everett. He described the interplay with the observer and the particle as a relative state, and that is what the theory was initially known as. Um, I think it was called the relative state theory. At least that's my reading on it. If someone out there has a better understanding, please let me know. I mean, I'm not pretending to be a highfalutin scientist philosopher who understands this stuff. The basic idea underlying the many worlds theory is that the subject-object event of particle observation with a specific outcome while it might be mathematically probable in this universe, it has infinite other outcomes that do happen in other branching off universes. So, these other universes, the only difference between one and another might be the location of one subatomic particle in one part of the universe or another. And from that infinitesimal difference, we can theoretically work our way up to large-scale differences between universes in which uh, universes, say, devoid of all matter and galaxies and stars never formed, and every permutation of those two extremes between. The basic idea that stems from the math is that for every event, there is an infinite branching off of other outcomes, and that event leads to other universes. Now, if that's true, I always kind of chuckle when DC and Marvel at this point have decided to decrease or condense their multiverses as if that could ever happen. Um, there are always infinite universes and always will be. But one of the things that's kind of interesting when you study the DC multiverse in particular is that it seems to kind of have a, a cycle of respiration to it. it almost, it's almost like it's alive some kind of like emergent artificial intelligence that goes through cycles of life. And the cycles of life, like I alluded to before, are basically ones of expansion and constriction, like respiration. Now, the person principally responsible for this many worlds theory is a, is a weirdo named Hugh Everett. Now, believe me, I say weirdo with love because this guy is wonderfully and gloriously out to lunch. While never formally... A Scientologist, he was known to have been uh, familiar with Dianetics and maintained a fierce distrust of conventional medicine, which is one of the hallmarks of L. Ron Hubbard's belief system. After essentially being laughed out of physics, he began working with the Pentagon, and among other things, one of his jobs was to figure out how to maximize the death toll for the Soviets uh, during a potential nuclear war while minimizing our own. I mean, Talk about a cryptic job. But he was also very condemning about the whole affair. He was one of the leading thinkers that began to chip away at the nuclear war paradigm by talking and writing about, quote-unquote, mutually assured destruction. There is a fascinating book by Peter Byrne about him called The Many Worlds of Hugh Everett III. Recommended. Pick it up. Now, Everett was uh, an absolute atheist. But he was also a firm believer in something he came up with called quantum immortality. Now, some have speculated this is one of the reasons Everett didn't care about medicine or care that he smoked profusely and drank like a fish. I mean, to quote um, Keith Lynch, Everett firmly believed that his many worlds theory guaranteed him immortality. His consciousness, he argued, is bound at each branching to follow whatever path does not lead to death. Everett was found dead July 19th, 1982, by his son, Mark. That son, Mark Oliver Everett, is um, the singer-songwriter of the band The Eels. In, 1990, um, excuse me, in 1996, Elizabeth, Everett's daughter, committed suicide and left a note that said she wanted her ashes to be thrown out with the garbage so she might end up in the correct parallel universe to meet up with Daddy. Um, because that was also what Everett wanted. He wanted to be taken out with the trash. Everett's ideas were mostly ignored and shunned by the world at large until 1970 or so, when Bryce DeWitt advanced Everett's theories. Uh, for further elaboration on that, 
on Everett and the many worlds theories. If you're interested, um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. You can there's a you can watch something called Parallel Worlds, Parallel Lives. It's a BBC documentary that looks at Everett the man and his theories through the eyes of his son Mark. I believe it's even on YouTube. Now, going back to comics, we already talked about how the time turn around and fast-paced publishing schedule of comics enables the medium to capture and reflect culture better than, I think, every narrative medium. Add to that the pressures, the creative pressures to put out monthly stories. The creators of all eras of comics are constantly looking for ideas where, wherever they can find them. I mean, Joe Simon, co-creator of Captain America, once said that any good idea in comics should be done no less than eight times. And in comics' ravenous appetite for story ideas, it assimilates and remixes from obvious kin mediums like pulp and science fiction. Jack Kirby was known to, when he was stuck for inspiration, uh, just to reach to one of his bookcases at random and start reading from any number of genre works. Um, Superman and the Doctor Occult creators, Siegel and Schuster, known known hardcore sci-fi nerds. So it's possible that somewhere along the line, someone read an early version of Everett's Many Worlds theories. I mean, it's possible. I've never found anything to substantiate that, but I, I just love the connection of all these personalities interweaving their lives and their ideas together, much like how the DC multiverse does with its characters and ideas. Or maybe some other writer did and wrote a story, published it in some magazine or book somewhere that influenced this idea of alternate Earths in the DCU. Or maybe it was just pure inspiration on part of the creators of Julie Schwartz and Bob Kaniger. There's really no way to know um, right now, as far as I know. So, with comic superhero mythologies, we have a pastiche of ancient mythological archetypes real-time cultural reflection, and incorporation of cutting-edge scientific, social, and political ideas. And that is the food, the fuel, that pushes this multiverse along. We're going to call it quits for now. We are going to be back with this series um, with my co-host, where we are going to look at two comics from the Golden Age, Wonder Woman 59 and Wonder Woman 89. Now, these are not recognized as, say, Showcase Number 4 or The Flash of Two Worlds as being canonically accepted as part of the DC multiverse. But it's the first time, as far as I can tell, you run into this idea in, in a very basic form. And Crisis fans like myself, multiverse fans like myself, have gone on and... and and accepted these stories as happening on Earth-59. I mean, there is a des designation for it. So that will conclude this first episode of DC Multiverse Crisis. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope I wasn't too boring with certain things. I just get on a tangent. There's so many fascinating aspects of these stories, of, of works that influence them, that, that I can't help but going down these these rabbit holes of history and, and, and society and science. So here's where I give you the contact information again. Um, the Bloodbath 2 podcast, of which this is a series of, is available on iTunes. If you want to support this podcast, I urge you, please go to iTunes, download us, subscribe to us, and rate us. You can email us at bloodbath2podcast at gmail. Now, that is the numeral two. And every time I say two in the next list, it is always the numeral two. Never spell it out. Um, we're on a, we have a Facebook page. It's blood, just search bloodbath2podcast. Um, we're on Tumblr. It's bloodbath2podcast.tumblr.com. We're on Twitter at bloodbath 2 pod and we have a youtube channel bloodbath 2 podcast essentially if you go to any social media and you just search for bloodbath 2 podcast you will find us now like i said this is going to be the first in a very long running series i don't know exactly when we're going to get into the studio to do the next installment but hopefully it will be soon because i know my co-host is, is is chomping at the bit to talk about these next comics and to 
she she has very special love for that first crisis so we're we're trying to get to that so that's going to be it for me for now um thank you once again for listening oh and just just one more note like i we say this on all the other podcasts and if this is the first time you've heard us or just heard me um i just want to state it again that please contact us if if you're a fan but also please contact us if you have a problem with us if if you don't agree with something we say, if you want to make criticisms, if you want to debate or argue, we're fine with that. We welcome conversation and critical examination. We love it. Um, so please, feel free to email us if you're like, hey, I don't really agree with that. Or did you really have to talk about all that quantum physics stuff? You know, Talk to us. We're, we're open to it. And we, we want feedback. So please, get in touch with us. Um, and that's going to be it for this edition. Stay tuned for whatever episode we have coming up next. Um, until that time, beware of spaceships and black holes. <laughs>